and good evening everyone thanks for inviting me um, from a second tier organization the women's resource center um, there's been so much said already um, great work that women are doing the campaign for rise is fantastic Katia for sharing your story and Shona for your what sounds like a fabulous PhD. Um, what's happening to the women's sector? Who are we meant to be and where did we come from? And I think it's already been said that women's specialist services were developed really by activists um, who understood that the personal was political, who understood that male violence against women is actually a global pandemic. And also even the UN have recognized it as both a cause and consequence of women's inequality. So any discussions that we have about women and what we need are in the context of global institutional sexist violence. That's the context. And that's why women talk about women only spaces. That's why they need women only spaces. Um, my organisation has done some research with frontline women's orgs around the Equality Act and often many of them are saying that they, they are very, um, they're not confident about using the single sex exceptions within the Equality Act, they're very worried. Um, for a number of different reasons. One, they might be trolled, attacked, their funders be contacted, um, but also really importantly, the whole burden of responsibility of implementing the single sex exceptions lies on individual organizations. How can that be um, an appropriate way to enact a law? Um, so, yes, it's been spoken about that women who work in the women's sector are not speaking out and women are frightened. I've spoken to countless women who actually support um, single sex spaces for women, but they're frightened to say that. Um, their boards might not agree, somebody on Twitter might attack them, they might phone their board. And it's just quite stunning to see the silencing and actually there isn't a debate. And, you know, if, if as women's human right defenders, then we must also support the human rights of everyone. And so we need to be able to have a debate that is not um, aggressive or, well, we just need to have it, that allows women to say what they want and trans people to say what they want. Um, we, need, we need to be able to move forward with this. But I think it's complicated, I think, because um, for some time now, the specialist led by and for women's sector has been, I feel, um, under threat of being dismantled by the state. And we have to acknowledge that women face state violence too, um, in a myriad of ways through state institutions. So we've had a number of different things happening to our sector, which have um, impacted on it. So from 50 years ago, 
when activists started women only organizations women only provision and I think it was Shona possibly I could be wrong who said she took it for granted that there were women only I've always taken it for granted you know my organization has built its work on protecting women only led by and for organizations we just took that for granted that that's what they are because that's what women want and women tell us that all the time um so I think the the other side that's really important to remember is we're not just about services and you said this Karen in the beginning the women's sector independent collective women only action is the single most critical thing to do in order to improve women's human rights so that that has been researched i think it was a piece of research that was over 10 or 20 years so you know it it it, it has some um, significant robustness, if you like. Um, and so we have made some gains, nowhere near enough. Um, and so, you know, it could be conspiracy theorists to think that the state is now finding different ways to um, basically put us back at the kitchen sink. Um, we've had commissioning practices for over, I don't know, 15, 20 years, moving from grant to commissioning, which has destroyed almost the collaboration and sharing between women's organisations. It has just, on so many levels, it's been a nightmare. It has penalised small specialists. It's penalised black and minoritised women's organisations. And we've also had... Um, a move towards a gender neutral approach to everything, um, which translates to favoring men basically, because in a patriarchal white supremacist society, anything that's neutral favors white men basically. Um, we've then got this notion of the professionalization of the women's sector, which I find absolutely insulting um, which again is about shifting it away from activism and focusing on wh what women need into a more business-like model which is completely inappropriate I mean we now get invited to things called market warming events so when did we start to turn women's pain and trauma into a market when how is that appropriate um i think the other thing that somebody mentioned was um the um sorry i'm forgetting everybody's name nicola mentioned about commissioners saying they want to hear service users for voices I mean everybody says that I'm sick of hearing it myself because they don't listen anyway they only listen to the voices that suit their narratives their ideology or their already decided policy positions so it's um it's almost a waste of time um I think I want to touch again on something Katia said which was about the um, the nurture and support that she received in the refuge because women's organizations and services were actually built on human love that's what they've been built upon human love for women and some of those women may never have experienced human love only abuse but as other women say i'm not sure who said it first but i know akima thomas says it revolutionary love because that's what it is it's human love and revolutionary love to change and i think the other thing that's important to highlight and repeat what cassia katia said about being in survival mode in the refuge and i too um like probably most of the women on this call and many in the sector i'm also a survivor of male violence and 
the need to create a sense of nurture, safety, human love, revolutionary love for women is absolutely critical. Um, because if you're going to be able to recover from trauma and also liberate yourself from the self-blame that normally goes with it by being in a service that has an analysis of structural inequality and that can reflect back to women that it's not because there's something wrong with you or you failed or you did something wrong. It's because this is what happens globally to women, you know, male violence. That's really important for women's recovery and empowerment, that word that's misused all the time, but also to acknowledge that women will become enraged at some point. And that's absolutely an appropriate response to what happens to us. And then how that rage can turn into politicization and fearlessness and how we continue to grow and recreate our movement when, you know, those of us who get old and die are no longer here. And I think that the things that are happening to the women's sector, I've mentioned some of them, um, is, about dismantling the social change aspects of our work. Because if you commission a housing association to run refuges rather than a specialist women's organization, you don't get that. You don't get that. Women are not going to be, have their consciousness raised. I doubt very much. So, what else did, oh, the other thing I wanted to pick up on, I think, again, that Nicola talked about was the legal things that we're supposed to have, such as equality impact assessments and the public sector equality duties, these were attached through the Equality Act that are perhaps little known about but even when they are um they're done really really badly um and so part of the problem we have is that our own equality act is not being implemented um there was some work done a while ago um and many local authorities didn't know anything about the equality act um the other thing that I need to say as well is sex not gender please um I mean there's there's so many other things I can say I just want to give two little personal anecdotes before I end because I know women have got lots to say and we don't want to take up all the airspace one of the things is about pronouns um and this whole debate around causing harm, which I hear all the time. And I was in a very small meeting with other equality organizations and um, the facilitator of the meeting started off by asking us to say our organization and our pronouns. And I, had just had a very disturbing call with a colleague who was basically somebody was trying to hound her out of her job for liking a tweet and I was really upset and almost in disbelief when I went onto this call and it was a zoom meeting and so when they said went round going what's your pronouns and they got to me now do remember that I'm a working class northerner and I don't usually mince my words and sometimes my mouth and my face goes into action before my brain does and I rolled my eyes at the mention of pronouns well I was um, berated in the nicest possible way but also the phrase harm was done was said to me nobody considered that I felt offended by an assumption that everybody on that call 
was okay with this whole idea of pronouns, which to me is problematic because um, how I read that is that you buy into the fact that you can choose your sex. And I, I don't buy into that. I think if anybody, however you want to live your life as an individual, go for it. But do not, on a, a, a policy level, start to force people um, to believe something that they intrinsically don't. That, 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 that's not okay on any level whatsoever. The other thing I just wanted to say as well is my concern for girls and young women and a, a story of um, a member of my extended family at uh, 16 who came out as a lesbian and um, didn't get very positive responses from some people around her and became um, quite depressed, went for counseling, uh, came back from her first session and said to her mom, oh, I might be a boy actually. And what had happened in the counselling is that was offered to her as a solution. And the other thing, I'm sorry, is the disease of pink and blue and the absolute extreme of gender stereotyping that is happening. I'm just, you know, as women's rights defenders, we have, we've wanted to abolish gender stereotyping. We want women to be able to be who they are that is not dictated to because they've got a, a, a vulva a vagina or breasts or whatever that we can be and so therefore that applies to men as well and um it, it's just interesting to me that the rise in gender stereotyping is also coming with the rise of choosing your sex ideology um i just i wonder if we didn't have the global sexist violence to women and we we didn't have gender stereotyping would that would this even be an issue i don't know that's my question anyway i'll finish there and uh thank you very much for having me and um revolutionary love to all the women.